Thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, here at uh, with the United Goalkeeping Alliance. Um, and here today on the podcast today, we have William. Um, William, please please tell us a little bit of who you are, where you are, and what is it that you do. Hey, guys. Uh, pleasure to be on the show. Thanks for having me. My name is William Van Zella. Um, Born and raised in Brazil and uh, been playing for the Baltimore Blast since 2012, professional indoor soccer team, uh, one of the greatest franchises in uh, indoor soccer history here in Baltimore, Maryland. And uh, I'm also a goalkeeper coach at John Hopkins University. So, okay, so we're, we're going we're gonna to dive deep a little bit, so to speak. So, um, so you are playing for, you know, in the major arena soccer league. Right, uh, like you just said, for one of the biggest franchises with with the, one of the biggest histories, um, in indoor soccer, Baltimore Blast. Um, before we go there, where are you originally from, and how did you get started playing goalkeeper? Um, like I said, uh, born and raised in Brazil. Um, <laughs> everybody has a different background, but for me, um, I was not very into the fact that I had to run back and forth as a field player. So I kind of decided that there was not many options out there, you know. So when you're in Brazil, you only play soccer. Um, then I didn't want to run. So I was like, okay, what is left? And goalkeeper was. So I went to go when I was like seven. And um, in Brazil, we don't really share the position. So you're a full-time keeper. So I became full-time keeper since I was seven playing uh, futsal and uh, outdoor. And then when I... Uh, turned 13, I try out for an outdoor team academy that I made. So I left my house, um, started to live five. I was living five, six hours away from my family in a dorm, having morning, afternoon practice, um, going to school from 7 to 11.45 midnight and reset the next day. So um, I became professional when I was 16. And then from there, it took over. I moved to Italy 2006 to play. Then I had two ACL surgeries. Uh, then I decided that I wasn't really capable to play outdoors anymore. I think um, I really struggled physically to be in goal. So I transitioned to futsal. And then I played futsal in Italy for about six years. And I also played 7v7. Um, I ended up playing for the national team. Uh, we played the World Cup in 2011. We won the World Cup in 2011 for seventh side, playing for Italy. Uh, like I mentioned before, I'm dual citizenship. And on that tournament, our coach here in Baltimore saw me playing. Then he reached out to me, and that's how I ended up in U.S. Now, that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot. <laughs> so, 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 so let's start with this. Um, for you at the A, you know, uh, so I, the first thing I heard was you specialized at like seven and eight, yes. right? Mm -hmm. um, for you, how was that experience? Do you regret that? Are you thankful for that? Um, how do you look upon that experience now? That's a, that's a great question. And, and again, I think it, both sides, you have a lot of pros and cons on this. Looking to that, I think it really benefit me to be specialized and focus on only one position and get to dive deeper into the position and get to know more. So I guess that I got a lot more knowledge that if I was playing field and and go. Uh, but also, you know, here in the U.S., you see a lot of the kids sharing, splitting time on the younger age uh, and playing field too. I think you have... You have more fun doing that, uh, but, you know, you, you also get to co compete, have more touches. I think it's um, overall is a good setup, but to me, being a specifically a goalkeeper was the greatest thing because I had a very good goalkeeper coach that got me through my youth age and, and, and let me be very clean as a goalkeeper. So I thought, I thought that learning in an earlier age, it's, it's helpful. So. Yeah, I think that when, you know, when anyone, coaches, parents, even players, whatever, try to paint everybody with the same brush, like, 
this is how this is how it's going to work for everyone, right? So we should yep. all play multiple sports. We should all specialize, right? I think that's where we we get it wrong, just in the sense that, uh, for example, you were very lucky that you had a very capable goalkeeper, coach, trainer that yep. um, allowed you to fully develop to your full capacity, you know, to your full capabilities, right? Where a lot of times maybe people don't have access to that. Um, you know, and um, obviously you had that uh, natural ability to do those certain, to learn that position. Um, and some players just don't have that. And, and maybe they find that later on in life, right? Maybe not yeah. at seven, maybe at 14, 15. Um, and, and I and, agree with you. Right. And playing different positions could work out. Um, yeah, to be honest, uh, to be honest, uh, here with my goalkeeper academy, I I do exactly what he said. You can't have one route apply to everybody because we are different. I do have goalies there eight and they're full time keepers, and they, but they're not into field. They don't want to play field, you know. So that's the best thing for them to be a full time keeper. But you also have that guy that, you know, oh, I like to be a striker to score some goals too. So by all means, go have that experience. Maybe you even better striker than a goalie so that's what you ended up doing i think uh, you gotta do what is what you have pleasure to do so if you're splitting time or playing multiple sports it is then go for but i think you get more you know deeper in one position if, of course if you're playing just a single sport but it depends yeah no that's that's usually the answer in sport and in, in, in coaching right it depends um <laughs> <laughs> now how was your At like you said, right? So like at 14, 15, how was that transition between indoor, outdoor, futsal, arena when you started, you know, and I don't know at what age specifically you started playing maybe the different sports, but how was that transition for you to play um, <clears throat> in, in different fields and in different, essentially different games? Yeah, in Brazil, in South America, uh, mostly, they all play futsal growing up only. You know, because they believe that it's a tight space, tight space with more opportunities for you to learn the quickness, the movements of the ball. You also get your skills and it's more dynamic. So you touch the ball a lot more. And that's why they want to to be playing futsal as you grow up. Uh, but then you start to play outdoors when you're like nine. Um, and Obviously, the dimensions of the fields are so different, but the mainly thing you you get it, you know, which is for field players the ability to check your shoulder, to play on on the space, to occupy the empty space, to get out of the trouble, you know, to be a skillful player. And for keepers specifically, you learn a lot about your footwork, quickness, uh, kick saves, agility, reaction, and decision making. Um, I think that's a A hard transition, but it's a great transition because it's a good time for you to still learn in the, the bigger field and big dimensions, but you got the basics all cleaned up and square. So I, I like that uh, transition. Yeah. And, and so like for, and we actually, you know, I, I, okay. So I'll just put out there, but so recently in one of, in one of, um, I won't even go there, but in one of our group chats, we had an opportunity for a, um, for, because a high level team, a very, very high level team was uh -huh. looking for a specific futsal goalie. Right. Yes. So yes, yes, um, yes, yes. There, like we didn't like, so we could, there was that we couldn't find a futsal goalie. So we were kind of now starting to look at the higher, t higher end of, like that elite level goalie that plays outdoor. Yep. How easy or difficult would have that transition been? Is it realistic or is it kind of like, it's not even the same sport, don't try it. Not at that level anyways. Not on that level, yes. Uh, if you go to a higher level, the 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 level is going to be way too too big of a gap between you and the other teams. If you, for instance, if you're trying to play in a high level Brazilian uh, futsal U15 team, uh, competitive team, you're going to get your butt kicked if you don't have experience on, on your, on your play. Even if you do have the good players, it's a different game, it's a different ball, different speed. 
and they would struggle. So I I would not recommend an outdoor keeper to join a competitive tournament uh, unless they do know what they're going to do. Yeah, it's it, yeah, and, and and it's very difficult. And again, and nothing nothing is impossible when you show up and you practice and you train for for a while, right? I mean, I mean, yes. I mean, we, I think we have that understanding that we all can get better, and maybe we're not there yet, but we can get there. It's just um, we also have to be realistic that it's almost like two different sports. Yes, correct, and, and they are different sports. So the fact that we know what we're supposed to do, which is keep the ball out of the net. The techniques that you apply, the the way you should stand, the set position, everything changed. So essentially, it's the same sport because it's soccer, but they're completely different. The speed of the game, the amount of touches that you're going to have, you know, the speed that the ball comes to you, uh, everything is very, very different. So, yes, it requires you to to spend some time, donate time, train, and, and learn watching the pros, you know. To, to get better. So what what's what's one of the things that transfers the, the easiest? What's one of the quickest things to transfer from the outdoor game to the indoor game? If you were to transfer one thing, um, what would you from, what, what would you what would you want to transfer? Uh that is a great question. I think it would be the shot stopping and close range, which is very much linked up with reaction. If you can be quick on your work and you can be fast enough to shift very quick, you will be able to cover major of the small goal, which is a futsal goal. It's pretty small compared to an outdoor goal. So to make yourself big and to be quick on your footwork, those are probably the main two things. It will be a shot stopper, but um, I think over shot stopper would be the correct footwork to shift from side to side quick and to predict what the next play is going to be. That's for sure. Yeah, no, and, and again, right, um, here we have William who plays for Baltimore Blast with the Major Arena Soccer League. And um, now you've been there 10, 10 years. So how, tell me about that transition from professional player to now coaching. How has that transition happened? Is it happening now? How did you get started with coaching? Um, I was coaching in Italy. Um, a lot of our futsal keepers as well. I did some of uh, outdoor keepers. But when I came to Baltimore, um, I started my own goalkeeper academy, which is called Born to Fly. And uh, and I started to, to love that. And I, I think it's part of life, you know, like we were talking before offline, uh, you teach and you learn. Yeah, I think that's that's a life that we all went through. You got somebody that taught you everything you know, and now it's time for you to share your knowledge to somebody else. And I, I love that process. To me, as much as I love to play, which I completely uh, in love with what I do and be able to play, it's unbelievable. But I think I have almost the same joy when I see a kid applying things that I taught them to do in the train session or in the game. When you see a film, I get so pumped up for a minute. I get goosebumps like when I see my goal is making saves and stuff. And that's a transition. I think it's a lovely transition as long as you continue to love the game. And, and as I mentioned before, I don't know everything. So these kids are still teaching me stuff. You know, I learn from them. I teach them. Uh, I spend a lot of time with kids and I love it. I think it's... It's a great time to spend the the love and to share the the passion that we have for the position. Yeah, no, and and I think that there is a very distinct psychological um, mentality where it's just a very un it's very unique, right? And you have to understand that mentality um, from a player's perspective because ultimately it is the player's game. So as a coach, if we are able to understand what they're going through, what they feel, um, and how to get through some of those difficult moments, I think ultimately that's where a lot of the learning happens when we connect with our players. So um, for you, talk to me a little bit about, um, and obviously you're extremely experienced, right? You're extremely experienced, but for you, how do you begin to build your own coaching philosophy? How do you begin to your own training philosophy? Um, and, and how does that happen? 
um, because it's a continual process. So can you explain to us a little bit about what you've gone through and how you've kind of started to build that part of your um, repertoire of your weapons as well? Or toolbox? Yeah, I think for me, um, I tried to, to have a combination and a little bit of a mix of, um, especially from the coaches I had previously in the past and, and what did I learn from them? So I get the best of each coach I had and try to put it in the same plate, you know, to apply each. Not only, like you said, it's the style that you wanted to, the keeper to be and the philosophy behind. So I try to combine everything my coaches taught me through my life with what I've learned myself and 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 try to put the best package out there. And when I do that, I think mostly – I tried to think of things that I didn't want coaches to apply to me as a goalie. So I'm not going to do the same thing to the kids because I felt that that wasn't helping me personally. So I tried to avoid those areas and put a package there. My philosophy, it's I got to teach them who I am and what I did. So if I train somebody, I want them to be like me. So if they come to my game, which majority of my keepers do not say everyone come to watch me, I will tell them all the time, say, you come in to watch me, you see me making a lot of mistakes. Like you watching any goalkeeper in any level make. The difference is how much do you, do you care for and how quick can you bounce it back from a mistake? Um, yeah. Specifically on my game, playing the indoor game, it's a game game of mistakes you're touching the ball all the time and you're always under pressure so you will make tons of mistakes you can't let one mistake put you down and your whole game is going to be affected by it. so i try to really focus on the discipline and the mental part of the game to me it's huge the decision making it's huge um i I really believe that the skills are coming secondary because uh, once you hit a decent level, every goalkeeper will be a great goalkeeper. It's a shot stopper. It's good on crosses. It's good in distribution. So the level gets very, very close. So to me, who stands out are the ones that are very mentally strong. The ones that once you make a mistake, you bounce it back from there and, and you make the next play and you don't get affected by it. Yes, inside yourself, you're like, oh, that's a huge mistake, but you don't show weaknesses. You look up, you stay strong, and you make the next play. So, okay, I'm a human being. I'm, I'm going to make a mistake, but that doesn't affect me. I'm going to continue to fight. So I try to make sure that my keepers are always working hard and, and focused to get the instructions. When my coaches were talking, and that's not just a coach's speech because I know all the coaches say that, but when my coaches were talking, I was, I was like a sponge. I was trying to absorb everything they would say to me because they had the knowledge, you know, they play pro in Brazil for 20 years and a guy played for the national team. You know, you need to learn from these guys. So I was like, whatever they said, I'm going to listen. I'm going to learn from. So I, I tried to have my keepers on the same note that they are listening. They are paying attention. They're asking tons of questions and they can improve their decision making because at the end of the day, we can teach them anything or everything in the game is whatever they decide on that split second. So they have to have, they, they need to earn their decisions. And you only earn your decisions as you're making poor decisions. Poor decisions will lead you to good decisions. So young ages, I tell my parents all the time, don't freak out if your keeper tries to come out on a breakaway and gets beat off position. They need to go experience that themselves in the game to realize that they made a mistake so we can adjust. In a, in a week from now, nobody's going to remember that play anymore. They're too young. They play games weekly, <laughs> but they will. So they can learn from that little mistake there and get better. So be patient right there. I know their coaches won't be patient, you know, and I get it. But that's a process that they need to go through. They need to experience. They need to make mistakes. You know, other, otherwise you're never going to learn. And, and how do we transmit that information to, to the parents? How do we tell that to the parents? 
Um, you know, because I think a lot of times, even us coaches, we create that barrier with the parents, right? And that's what the United Goalkeeping Alliance is here for, to break that barrier down, right? Um, but how do we as coaches start to knock that barrier down and transmit that information to the parents to say, hey, listen, this is what you should expect. This is what you could expect. Um, and, and don't, don't, don't rely too much on, you know, don't put too much stock on just the mistake or just the decision. It's a learning process. So how do we tell that to the parents? Yeah. So I personally, I talk to my parents all the time and, uh, on my sessions, I record my sessions and I send to the players afterwards a link for them to watch themselves because I think that uh, once you see yourself in making that play, you will learn twice because you went through before and you thought about it and then you see yourself makes it even better. And I walk the parents with me. I want the parents with me to listen to my instructions and what I said because at the end of the day, I'm not there for their games, but the parents are. So I want the parents to fully understand what is a mistake? What is a play that we could have done better? What is a play that we could not do anything? And when should we push the kids to the edge and, and, and go hard on them, say this is unacceptable? And when should we just give them love, give them a hug and go get an ice cream and forget about that day? Uh, to me, it's a very important fine line where they need to understand. Keepers will get the blame. We all know that. So no matter how hard you play, you lose it to nothing. That's on keeper's fault. So <laughs> that, what does that mean? Your teammates going to blame you. The parents of that kids are going to blame you. Your coaches are going to blame you. The referee is going to blame you. Everybody's going to blame you. So when you get in the car, sometimes you need a good word of encouragement word or just no word at all to let it go. Or even, like I said, go get an ice cream and forget about today. Uh, those days are, are important, but also there are days there that the parents need to find line and say, hey, that is too much. You can't do that. This is unacceptable. That's not what you want to do. And, and have some charge. It's a hard one for the parents as well because it's not it's not easy for you to be on the sideline and keep hearing that, oh, what is the keeper doing? He sucks or whatever. And you know that. You know, they're talking about your, your own child. So to be quiet on the sideline and, and to not go hard on your son, it's a very hard situation that the parents need to learn. And they also have to experience. So I do deal with parents that they call me afterwards like, he gave up a bad goal. It was like this, this and that. What should I say? You know, and I try to walk them through. You teach the parents as well. And I'm not trying to teach them how to manage their own child, but how do you go with them on the process that we need to learn? Sometimes you have to just let it go. And sometimes we have to push them to the edge and say, this is unacceptable. So parents do need to find that fine line. Yeah. And, and as coach, I mean, I can tell, I can see the, I can hear, see the passion that you have for, for teaching and, um, and your coaching and, and obviously, uh, just being you committing to sending your players videos. I mean, that's, that's a lot of work. And I think just the fact that you do take the time to walk parents through that, it just shows how much you care about those players. Um, and also the ability to not shy away from those difficult conversations, because sometimes those conversations are not easy. They're very difficult, uh, but they need to be had. And like you said, it's a very fine line between, Hey, it's just the goal. Don't worry about it. And Hey, that's the 10th goal. You're giving up the same way. <laughs> like that's not acceptable. Um, I go, sorry to cut you off, but very quick. I go off a lot on what type of mistakes are this ones. Yeah. Technical mistakes. Sometimes I tend to more say, hey, can we watch the film? Let's talk about this technique here. Look how your shoulders are. Look how your hands here. And go specifically to the technical point afterwards, but more leans towards it's okay. We're humans. You know, you will make mistakes, but try to not make the same mistake again. And the mental mistakes, on my view, are the ones that we should be pushing. So if they're playing a through ball and you're down your line, and you're not even aware of what's going on on the field, that's on you. 
Yeah, I, I'm not saying that you should save the breakaway, which is a hard thing for us to do, but you should be there giving yourself a chance to make a save. So I go a lot in base of the mental mistakes or things that you control because we don't control how hard the striker is going to shoot, but I can control where my position is going to be. So if I control my position and I'm in a good position, maybe I save. Maybe I won't, but I have a shot. I have a chance. And I'm very picky on that to make sure you give yourself a chance to make a save. So I tell my parents a lot of when is a mental mistake to be a little harder on the kids, when is a technical mistake to kind of lean back and say, okay, we're human beings. Let's figure it out what's wrong in this play and not make the same mistake. No, that's that's awesome. That's wonderful. And um, and yeah, no, I mean setting realistic expectations. And and just being real with the players is super important, you know, whether they're uh, nine or they're 19, right? I mean, you have to absolutely be honest. You have to be critical and you also have to be, you know, you have to show empathy, right? At the end of the day, we're all, all human beings, but um, we're all growing and developing. So um, now with all that said, um, month of December, we are going to be uh, working on and presenting on, uh-oh. All right, so we're going to keep this rolling. Hopefully he comes back in. And um, and just friendly reminder, this is the Goalkeepers Podcast brought to you by the United Goalkeeping Alliance. And the uh, month of December, we are going to actually present on um, how to transfer those skills uh, between indoor um, and outdoor soccer, right? Uh, I, I don't even want to call them completely different sports, but I want to, I definitely want to call them. Um, they're, they're two different entities. So he's back on. What happened? There we go. Nope. It's, <laughs> it's all good. I just, I just kept rolling. So, um, um, but no, I heard you said that in December we're, and then I lost you. Sorry. No. So, um, yeah. So in December we're going to be presenting on, um, the, you know, the transferring the skills between indoor, outdoor soccer, um, some of the differences, some of the similarities, um, and, and then talking about indoor soccer specifically. So, um, and I know you're, you're a little busy, so I don't know. If I, are you going to be presenting? I don't know if you're going to be presenting or not, um, but I do know you are going to work on some of the presentations. So um, what are your thoughts on um, indoor, outdoor, and the transferring of skills? Yeah, I'm very, very sad to say that I won't be able to present on Sundays because we have games on Sundays. And uh, when I talked to Eric, I was very disappointed about it because obviously uh, I would love to share uh, my thoughts and share my, my comments with the kids. But we will have a, a walkthrough talk with uh, just me and Eric. I think it will be on Thursday. Um to go through specifically so it will be a little different than the previous months uh, so that's an extra that we're going to put it out there because eric really thinks that i should be sharing my experience with uh, the young players right there which i which i which i love it you know um but i know there are a lot of guys there that are going to present to have so much knowledge i know coach mark is there he's been on the indoor soccer forever <laughs> and he definitely knows a lot about, and I know Matt's going to be there. So there are other guys that is going to, they're going to take very good care of like every month. So I'm very excited to see what the outcome will be, because again, you teach and you learn. So I'm very excited to see what can I learn from them and their, their presentation. That's awesome. And, and no, I appreciate it. And I appreciate you making time for this as well. And um, so once again, how do we get a hold of, so again, major arena, soccer league um can you talk to us a little bit about that um i know like obviously we want to this is if we're going to be talking about indoor soccer we want to promote the league um can you talk to us a little bit so when's your season when does that start when does it end and um you know again i know you've been playing you said you know 10 12 years um talk to me a little bit about that part um as we wrap it up here Okay, so I'll try to make it 10 years very short. Um, <laughs> I've been playing here in Baltimore for 10 years. I'm very lucky, as I said, that to be part of one of the biggest franchises in history. Um, I, from 
one year that COVID hit, we didn't have the end of the season. So that not counting out of the equation. So then you go to nine years of being in eight finals. Uh, so I, I went to eight championships uh, series and I won five. So very, very lucky to be uh, in a competitive level. Last year, uh, my team, unfortunately, didn't play because of COVID. So I went in alone to San Diego and I played for San Diego Soccer, which is the other biggest franchise in the history. So I, I'm very lucky to say that I played in both franchises and I won a championship with both franchises as well, So, uh, which is pretty amazing. We won the championship last year in San Diego against um, Ontario Fury. The season is going to kick off. It's already started, but our first game is this Saturday at home. We're facing Florida Tropics at 6 p.m. You can watch the games on YouTube. Um, just type Baltimore Blast Saturday 6, 6.05 um, on um, YouTube so you can uh, catch up some games. MASL. Their teams from we used to have teams from Mexico and Canada as well, but unfortunately, do COVID restrictions and travel, and so they're not part. So we have only teams uh, in the US. I have team in Utica. Um, we have Harrisburg, Baltimore, Florida, Milwaukee, St. Louis, Washington, um, San Diego, Ontario, and going on and on, Kansas City. So it's a it's a competitive league. I think this year is going to be very very competitive. I think a lot of teams are close. I really don't know what's going to happen. I'm curious to see teams playing. I I think it's going to be a good year for for the league. And I know for the goalkeepers watching the game, you see tons of actions for the goalkeepers with your feet and with your hands. So you have to be very active in both sides of the ball. No, that's 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 cool. That's awesome. And um, and obviously, yes, I would recommend everybody to check that out. Um, you know, may again just go to Major Arena Soccer League, and if you just you know type that in, you will find all the all the teams that are there, and uh, hopefully you're able to join join them live. Right, go to a game, um, support your local goalkeeper, um, and your local team. Right, because I, like I know here in Philadelphia, we used to have the kicks. We don't have the kicks anymore. Um, yep. So now I have to drive to Utica or Baltimore um, or yeah. Harrisburg. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, and, it's, and it's not a long drive. It's like two hours and to go watch professional soccer. So um, it's, it's awesome. Make sure you support, again, make sure you support the league. Um, so, William, uh, I appreciate your time. I appreciate you coming here. Is there any last piece of advice you want to leave the listeners with? Yes, the like I said at first, thank you for having me. It's it's always so nice to talk soccer to anybody, especially with people that understand the pain that I go through when I'm in goal. Yeah, um, for the kids, if you ended up going to a game and you watching the Baltimore Blast play, make sure you come behind the goal and, and say hi to me. Make sure you get an opportunity to come say, hey, I'm part of Goalkeeper Alliance and we can chat after the game. I'll you know love to talk to you guys. That would be very cool. Um, and the piece I can leave you guys with advice is if you will play indoor or futsal this winter, uh, just try to improve your, you know, reactions, uh, kick saves and your footwork to be solid with your footwork. Like I said, both sides of the ball are very, very important for goalkeepers playing a uh, indoor soccer game or futsal. So I think it's a good opportunity for you to, you know, leave it the dives aside a little bit, you know, the air balls, the crosses, and start to work on other pieces that are components very, very important for an outdoor keeper to watch it, a professional goalie playing, whoever do you, you know, watch it on, you know, Champions League or whatever, you will see those kick saves, the slide saves, the breakaways, you know, that is the straight futsal. So if you can work on this, I think it's going to help you to improve your own game and maybe uh, for your next season on spring, you'll be ready and better goalkeeper than you are right now. Yeah. And I, you know, and I, and I, I totally agree. Just keep it simple, right? Work on two, three things that you can while you're indoor and then um, it'll translate to when you're outside, uh, just like a field player would. So um, again, William, thank you very much. Um, if we want to get a hold of you, how do we get a hold of you? Um, so you can follow me on Instagram. It's my last name, Vanzella, V-A-N-Z-E-L-A, and number zero, which is my number. Uh, you can also visit 
www.wearebornttofly.com. That's my company. So you have a lot of information about training sessions, camps, clinics, and upcoming stuff. Um, I try to put some videos there as well. And my Facebook is William Vanzella, my first and last name. Um, again, if you guys join one of my social media, make sure you say hi. I try to engage everybody and send some videos and, and, and talk as much as possible about goalkeeping stuff. That is uh, fantastic. And again, right, um, that's how we grow our network. That's how we connect um, as goalkeepers. And so make sure we're following um, William on all the social media platforms. Make sure we're hitting like, retweet, sharing it. And um, and again, right, it's a lot of value that you're bringing to the table. So thank you for being on. We appreciate it. And um, we'll see you guys next week. Yeah, thank you, guys.